said that uh, Yahweh accepted his repentance, and this is a Jewish perspective, and then the Muslim chimes in and says, well, you're saying Yahweh changed his mind. No. Actually, <clears throat> if I were you, next time when they quote Jeremiah 22, 24 to 30, and then you say that according to indications from the book of, book of Chronicles, and according to Jewish exegesis of the Old Testament, specifically comments found in the Talmud, Jeconiah was convicted while in prison, repented, Yahweh accepted his repentance and forgave him. Now, if they're saying that's a change in God's mind, then that's going to introduce a major difficulty for them because in the Quran, Allah is always changing his mind. But before I get to that, let me show you something from the book of Jeremiah. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? And you probably already know this. Uh, according to Jeremiah himself, unless the text is clear, unless the text says that Yahweh has determined to do something and there's nothing that's going to hold him back from doing it. Uh, for example, let's look at Jeremiah 15 verse 1. Uh, Karamil, yes, we, uh, the Talmud has blasphemous things to say, but it doesn't mean you throw out the baby with the bathwater. The Talmud also has some interesting things to say. It's the same thing with the Quran, Karamil. The Quran has some blasphemous things to say, but also has some good things to say because all truth is God's truth and there is no book that doesn't contain some true statements. Right? <laughs> Karamil, you with me? So we're not endorsing the Talmud. We're simply showing that even the Jews understood that as far as the example of Jekyll is concerned, he repented and God accepted his repentance. But we're not endorsing the Talmud and I agree with you. The Talmud is actually even more blasphemous than the Quran. Whereas in the Talmud... But now, Bobo, look at this. Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go for, forth. Do you see that, Bobo? Unless you find statements of this type, of this nature, where Yahweh says, look, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many times you pray. I will not accept your intercession for the people. I'm fed up with them, and I have to punish them. Pour out my wrath, and then I'll turn to them in mercy. Unless you find those kind of statements, assume that God's promises and threats are conditional. What do I mean by that? God promises to bless the righteous on the condition they persist in their righteousness. God threatens to destroy the wicked on the condition that the wicked do not repent. However, Jeremiah 18, 5-12 tells us that normally God's promises and threats are conditional. They're not unconditional unless the text tells us. Are you with me? Are you with me, Bobo? For example, Jeremiah chapter 7 and 44, you know what he says to Jeremiah? Jeremiah, exactly, Bobo. But in Jeremiah chapter 7 and 44, they're too lengthy to quote, but I invite you to read, because remember, this comes from Jeremiah. The example of Jeconiah is from Jeremiah 22, verses 24 to 30. If you go to Jeremiah 7 and 44, Yahweh tells Jeremiah to notice what the women are doing, right? They're baking cakes to the queen of heaven. Because of it, I will not relent. Don't waste your time praying for them. Because look, they provoke me to such an extent, I have no choice but to punish them and pour out my anger. And Ezekiel confirms that. When his anger is spent upon them, then he'll to mercy. You with me there, Bobo? So what's my point? Unless the context suggests otherwise, assume... That God's promises and threats are conditional, unless the text suggests otherwise. The context must make it clear that it's an unconditional statement. Otherwise, assume that God's promises and threats have conditions that must be met. In fact, if Millie doesn't mind, or Barjona doesn't mind, let's quote Jeremiah 18, 5 to 12, specifically 7 to 11. This is the same book, Bobo, that proves your point. This now proves the point you're making. That when God threatened to cast off Jeconiah, right, and cast them off from his hand. If he was a signet ring, he'd cast them off his finger. That wasn't unconditional. That wasn't unconditional. Because notice what God says in the very book of Jeremiah. Bobo, read. Jeremiah 18, he's quoting now 7 to 11. Yeah, here's the point. Here's the proof, Bobo. Jeremiah 18, 7 to 11. If you want to read the entirety, read 5 to 12. But we'll just read 7 to 11. Read with me. Now watch. Let's read this. You can stop, Barjona. Thank you, bro. Read with me. Even though I think he's quoting the King James, because I guess he likes Shakespearean English. 
even though he doesn't speak in his Shakespeare, we'll forgive Barjona, right? Reading and translation in a language that he doesn't speak. He doesn't speak English, but that's fine. All right. <clears throat> Until Millie brings it up, let's read it together, Bobo. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pluck up and to pull down and destroy it? Now notice the condition. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Did you see it? God's promises and threats are conditional. Right? And at what instant, instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Yahweh, Behold, I frame evil against you and devised a device against you. Return you now, every one of you, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. Did you see what he says? I'm about to bring destruction. Turn to me before it's too late. But unfortunately, as the other chapters of Jeremiah shows us, they didn't turn in time. It was too late for them. You with me there, Bobo? But do you see what God said? God said, if I say to a nation that I will prosper it, however, if it then turns away from me and refuses to hear my voice, I will relent from blessing that nation. And if I say to a nation, I'll destroy it. But if it repents, I'll relent from destroying it. Now you can see that as God changing. Or you can see it as God being consistent with his nature. For example, if you look at it on a surface level, like they do, then it seems like God is changing. Actually, if you think about it, this shows that God is consistent and he's unchangeable. What do I mean? If God tells you he's going to destroy you, but then you repent and turn to him, and he destroys you anyway. Is he then being compassionate and merciful? Or is he being unjust and cruel? He says he's going to bless you, but then you turn away from him and commit heinous crimes and sins, growth, but he continues to bless you. Is God then being just? Is God being righteous? <clears throat> In other words, God's character demands that he acts and responds to you in the way in which you act towards him. His holiness demands that if you turn away from righteousness, he punishes you. But if you he's going against his nature. At the same time, right, if you are someone who's seeking its face, and you are someone who's obeying him, it's such that he'll bless you and reward you for those acts. But then if you turn away from him, right, deny him, commit heinous crimes and follow other gods if he continues to bless you and reward you that means he's being unjust because he's rewarding you for evil so he's no longer true to his character if he does that so do you see that actually if you study these passages and bring out their implication no greater proof could be deduced that God is actually consistent to, him, to himself than what we read here because His Holiness demands that if someone who is righteous turns away from Him, that person must be punished. And His love and compassion demands that if someone turns to Him in fear and repentance, that He forgives that person. However, if He goes ahead and still punishes the person who's repented, or He continues to bless the righteous who now has become wicked, then He's being untrue to Himself. And that means God's character is capricious and mutable. You with me? Bobo, you understand what I'm getting at? Okay, now, how does this apply to Jeconiah? Je Jeremiah 18, 7 to 11. God says, if I threaten to punish a nation, but if they turn from their ways, evil ways, then I will relent. Jeconiah was, was told by God that he will be left childless in the sense that he'll have no one sitting on his throne representing him. But now when Jeconiah is taken into captivity and gets convicted, right? And he turns to God and seeks his face. Would God be consistent with himself true to himself if he refuses to forgive him in light of what he just said in Jeremiah 18 7 to 11 what he you got it Bobo so how how is this an indication of God changing his mind in order when this beautifully illustrates the unchangeable character of God that God is always true to himself and therefore takes into account the way you respond to him in order 
right? For him to respond appropriately to your actions. You with me there? Now, if the Muslim wants to say, if the Muslim wants to say that this is a change in God's mind, then he condemns Allah because you know what? Then Allah can never truly forgive sinners who repent. Because if he does so, that means he's changing his attitude and disposition towards them. Right, Bobo? For example, when Muhammad's followers were pagans and worshipping idols, was God displeased with them? Was God angry towards them? Or was God okay with their sin? Now, they'll tell you, no, God hated their sin and was displeased with them. But when they repented, did God remove his displeasure from them and turn towards them in love and mercy? They'll say, yeah, thank you for saying that God, your God changed his mind. You see how silly and stupid that is? That's a silly and stupid and very superficial way of looking at things. Because we don't believe that God is immobile, right? But we believe God is a being that does interact truly with his creatures. Otherwise, it's just a big game because God doesn't really interact with anyone. He remains aloof. Because he's so transcendent that he can never interact and be affected by anything we do in time and space. Well, then end up becoming a deist, not a theist. Because that's deism. You got it, Bobo. And I'm going to give you some articles. Do you know one of the names of Allah? You know what one of his names are? And the Muslims got so angry at me at bringing this out. They tried to refute me, but miserably failed. Because I wrote a response to one Muslim. Who ended up confirming. Do you know what one of the names of Allah is? No, Makir means he's a deceiver. One of his names? Okay. His, one of the names of Allah is At-Tawwab. Tawwab. At-Tawwab. You know what Tawwab means? Tawwab is the Arabic word for repent. One of the names of Allah in the Quran is that he's At-Tawwab. The one who relents. The one who repents. Relents towards his creatures. That's one of his names in the Quran. Are you aware of that, Bobo? Let me get you the links, but the only way I can post the links is if, I was, if I'm an admin. But I'll send it to Barjona to post it in the room. Let me get you the links to the article where I show that Allah repents. Because they don't want to admit that Allah can be affected. So they don't want to ascribe to Allah a change of disposition, a change of attitude, right? Because they have a definition of what God can and cannot be that's not even backed up by the Quran. And then they force the Quran to agree with their definition. And even Christians can be guilty of doing the same thing. Instead of letting God be God and let God define what immutability is and what immutability isn't, we already have a definition of unjust to fit our definition, otherwise you can't be God. So we too are guilty of that to some extent. Let God define what it means for him to be unchanged and is unaffected by what we do. God is affected by what we do because he does his response to his creatures has nothing to do with his unchangeable character. God bless you, bless you God's Aussie.